Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the United Nations Association of the USA for our Global Engagement Online Series, a semi-monthly program that connects members of the public to high-level UN and US officials to discuss our world's most pressing issues. Today, we'll focus in on global and local solutions for zero hunger. Hello, I'm Bren Martin. Today, we will be discussing the global and local solutions to not only zero hunger, but reducing food waste intersecting between the SDG2 and SDG1, which you know is zero poverty and zero hunger. Also, the innovations and in challenging the status quo of the food systems. I'm excited to be one of the UNUSA Global Goals Ambassadors for Zero Hunger. I've been honored to be able to um, present to some high school students who were all from all over the world in different countries to talk about zero hunger and their excitement to make a difference in that. So that was very exciting for me. And I've had a chance to volunteer at the community kitchen in my area, as well as uh, when I was a PTA president, we had started a community garden at our school. And that was fun to watch one of the uh, better skilled ladies who uh, made a profession of it, did a wonderful job with our garden and helped to provide food to some um, neighborhoods in our area. Um, also, I had a chance to volunteer at the cafeteria. And I must tell you, as wonderful as our students and, and, and leaders are, it was concerning that the size of some of the waste. And um, I would encourage the kids to try to eat those vegetables and fruit and try to save some of those whole fruits and share them to reduce that waste. But as we go on throughout the program, you will see that that's a serious problem. So again, we were grateful that you're here. If you develop any questions along the way, drop them in the Q&A chat. And I'm very passionate about making this change uh, to zero hunger, I'm sure you are too. And so is my cohort, Diana Daniels. Thank you, Bren. Yeah, my name is Diana and I am the other Global Goals Ambassador for SDG2 Zero Hunger. And what brought me to become an ambassador was mainly um, my recent work with the FarmLink project over the past year or so. Um, we are a nonprofit that rescues surplus produce from farms and gets it to communities in need. And while working on this project, you know, it sort of a temp it is a, a temporary solution and fix to, um, to hunger. So I wanted to dig deeper into what long-term solutions could be found to rebuild and reshape the food systems that currently exist and are failing to support many people. Exciting. The UNA USA members have been learning about the issue of zero hunger throughout the zero hunger case competition. And it'll run through April 18th and there will be a link uh, for that in the chat. Uh, right now we're going to do an interactive survey. So get ready to press those buttons and, and use your noggin and give us your, your honest thought. It's okay if you get something wrong. There's no such thing as wrong as this. We just want to know what you think. Okay. Now, due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, how many Americans may face food insecurity? Do, 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 do. And I'll go ahead and ask the next one and then we could go over them at the end. By what year does the UN hope to achieve SDG two, target one to end hunger and ensure access by all people? And number three, what percentage of global workers are employed in agriculture? Hmm, things that make you go hmm. <laughs> Okay, do we need more time? All right, let's look at the survey. Gosh, half of you said 25 million. Wow, what a good answer. I mean, it's not good that it's that high, but you are aware of a lot of what's going on. 
and that's and that's good. Millions of children and families living in America face hunger and food insecurity. Uh, security every day. And due to the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, more than 42 million people may experience food insecurity. And that includes a potential 13 million children. Gosh. So 42 million and 13 million children. So so there really is a, a overlap, a little tricky there. <laughs> but most of you have a good grasp and, and had a good idea that it definitely wasn't 5 million. Okay, and our target year is, of course, as you know, 2030. And we got uh, nearly 80% who said that because that is the target of most of our goals. But there has been some recent discussion about extending that uh, because it would cost billions to try to reach that 2030 goal. But, um, but perhaps as we go, we could get some of the experts to talk about uh, those dates and, and, and where we are. Okay, and what about the percentage of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, people employed in agriculture? Let's see what you all said. Survey says, gosh, you all got it. More than half of you said 26%. And uh, about a fifth of you said 15% and nearly that said 20. So you all knew it was, it was uh, more than 5%. <laughs> you knew it was, <laughs> it was kind of up there. So that is good that we have that many people in agriculture, but of course, imagine what we could do if, if that increase. All right, so we're gonna turn it over to Diana. All right, thank you, Bren. Um, so to kick off our program today, we'll be hearing from two UN agencies who play a role in addressing global hunger, the World Food Program and the Food and Agriculture Organization. So our first speaker is Jochebed Louis-Jean, interviewed by the Youth Observer to the UN, Dustin Liu, earlier this year during our UNA-USA Global Engagement Summit. So we're just gonna play a couple minutes of that interview for you all to give sort of an introduction to their work. And now I am so pleased to welcome Joshua Bed Louis Jean from the UN Food World Food Program. Thank you so much for joining me, Joshua Bed. It is so wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much, Dustin. I'm so happy to be joining you. Well, firstly, congratulations to you and to the UN World Food Program for being awarded this year's Nobel Peace Prize. I'd like to start there. How does the Nobel Peace Prize reflect WFP's programs and priorities? And I'd love for you to share with us what the organization has been doing for so many years to combat worldwide hunger. Thanks again, uh, Dustin. Um, so we were all very humbled and extremely honored to receive the world, uh, sorry, the Nobel Peace Prize last year. Um, I know it was a terrific morale boost uh, to our colleagues who are working in program countries, a lot of them in the most remote locations, many of them in the most dangerous duty stations. Um, what we know is that there are about 700 million people in this world that go to bed hungry each night. And so what we're hoping is that the Nobel Peace Prize will allow us a, a newer and bigger platform to help amplify the voices of those 700 million people. And we hope by amplifying their stories and their needs, we can then inspire global action from individuals, from communities, corporations, governments, to join WFP in the fight against world hunger. So a little bit about WFP, um, it was established in 1961 as a food aid program under FAO. And in the 60 years since then has morphed into the largest humanitarian organization in the world that focuses on hunger and food security. And it's, it's really a two prong approach when you look at it. So we have on one hand saving lives. So that's WFP and emergencies, be that natural disasters, man-made conflict, if they're slow or sudden onset, the COVID pandemic, WFP is there on the ground in most emergencies, feeding people, populations on the move, people in need. So that's the saving lives portion. The changing lives is really our development resilience portfolio. So for example, WFP is the largest provider of school meals globally. 
And there's a lot of ways that WFP is using every tool in their toolkit to ensure resilience and capacity building for governments, for communities, and for individuals. And so it's really been six decades of fighting hunger and famine globally. Well, thank you so much for your organization's work on this really important issue. And I so appreciate this focus on stories. I think oftentimes we get so bogged down by statistics and I really appreciate how it really is centering it around those uh, millions of individuals who we really need to support in this critical issue. Uh, we just All right. And to see more of Dustin's interview with the World Food Program and watch a no waste cooking class with Chef Arthur Potts, be sure to check out the recordings from our Global Engagement Summit and a link will be shared in the chat now. Okay, thank you. To continue our conversation with UN colleagues, we are joined today by the FAO Communications and Partnership Consultant, Adi Zubar Muhammad. Okay, now in the video we just watched, Dustin talked about the importance of pairing personal stories with stats to really show the scale of the issues on global hunger. Can you tell us about the story of FAO and the work that you're doing right now? Thank you so much, Brenda. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, so FAO, the Food and Ag Cultural Organization of the United Nations actually has deep roots in North America. It was President Franklin Roosevelt who called for a UN organization that focused on food, nutrition, and agriculture um, in Hot Springs, Virginia, two years before the organization was established in 1945 in Quebec, Canada. And this was during World War II, so there were thousands of people suffering from hunger and who are impoverished. Um, since then, FAO has been working tirelessly to defeat global hunger as one of the most technical UN specialized agencies. And so we're dedicated to collecting, analyzing, and disseminating um, data to help decision makers. And we're on the ground in more than 130 countries to help um, governments and farmers, agricultural workers improve their agricultural, forestry, and fishery practices. And while setting international standards and norms to help um, implement policies at the broader level. Um, since FAO it works, works across so many different sectors, we're also the SDG, uh, custodian of 21 of the SDG indicators that look at um, gender equality, efficient use of water, food loss and waste, and monitoring fish and forest stocks. At the FAO Liaison Office for North America, which is uh, where I'm working and it is based in Washington, DC, we work to kind of raise awareness about FAO's knowledge products, and kind of convene um, different policy uh, workers, partner with different academic institutions to come up with public outreach and, and research policy guidance. That's excellent, that's a lot. <laughs> and we appreciate everything you're doing. How are the voices of the most marginalized uh, communities affected by hunger being heard and amplified by FAO on a more fine tuned level? Yeah, so FAO really advocates for the rural poor who are, have like mostly been left behind. For instance, family farmers who um, make up about 9% of the world's farms and produce over 80% of the world's food are oftentimes poor and food insecure themselves. So through, for instance, the UN Decade on Family Farming, FAO is promoting for better enabling policy environments to strengthen family farmers for gender equality and to promote climate resilient farming, um, to promote, uh, to safeguard biodiversity. And um, it is also important to recognize the important role that women can play as change makers. If women had the same access to resources that men uh, would, agricultural yields would rise by almost a third. And so 150 million fewer people would, be hung would, be, uh, would, would not be hungry today. Wow, wow. Okay, so you, you, you sort of just shared with us um, a lot of things that we can learn from them, but um, we have so much to learn in the process of making our food systems more sustainable in uh, indigenous uh, communities, and they've been practicing that for many years. Can you share maybe a few more things that we can do to amplify our practices based on what they've shown us? Sure, so um, first and foremost, uh, we need to ensure that indigenous people's rights to self-determination, access to land, water, 
uh, territories and natural resources are protected and preserved. This is critical to ensure that indigenous people can continue to sustainably manage uh, their natural resources. Um, and in learning from indigenous people, amplifying their practices, we also need to understand the diverse worldviews they have and they bring to global debates, um, you know, such as observational system science, cosmic vision, um, their approach to reciprocity, balance, respect, and responsibility. And so um, these are some of the underlying factors as to why indigenous food systems are inherently more sustainable. So we need to respect and amplify those, um, those attributes. And a recent FAO publication showed that deforestation rates in Latin America and Caribbean are significantly lower in indigenous and tribal territories where governments have formally recognized collective territorial rights. So by just listening, respecting, and valuing their contribution, um, we can really amplify their practices. Wow, that's, that's awesome. Later in the program, we will hear more about the National Young Farmers uh, Coalition and how their agency is working with younger generations to address food insecurity. So how is FAO doing that uh, to address that in their lifetimes? Sure. Um, so. Uh, Youth make up roughly a fifth of the global population in developing and emerging economies, and agriculture has a huge untapped potential to support them. Evidence shows that most migrants are young, between 15 and 34, and unemployment is one of the biggest drivers. So by promoting decent rural employment, there's a lot to gain. Um, so FAO works at the global, regional, and country level to help governments um, implement policies that promote uh, youth employment in agriculture mm -hmm. and through programs such as the junior farmer field schools that we have. Uh, it's like an after school program. FAO trains youth on agriculture, animal husbandry, and, and um, marketing uh, to help uh, youth get into agriculture. And uh, we're showcasing different success stories about how youth are able to learn technologies and help other farmers really adapt to sustainability and uh, increase their agricultural productivity. Wow, yes, and we do need that. I am excited about the upcoming uh, UN Food uh, System Summit that's going to take place in September. Um, what are some of those, the issues on the horizon for food insecurity and what are you all doing to help work across other UN agencies? Yeah, so the UN um, Secretary General has really wants to center food systems at the center of achieving all of the sustainable development goals and putting food systems at the heart of it. And um, it's exciting to see how the summit is soliciting inputs from like everybody in the world through global um, independent and national dialogues and um, through the different action tracks uh, that are looking at food security and nutrition, sustainable consumption, nature, positive production and equitable livelihoods and resilience. So FAO is the co-chair of Action Track One, which focuses on ensuring access to safe and nutritious food for all. Um, according to our latest findings from the State of Food Security and Nutrition Report, nearly 690 million people are undernourished. We're not progressing at the rate we need to on other nutrition indicators, such as wasting, stunting, low birth weight, or exclusive breastfeeding, obesity is rising in all of the regions of the world. And furthermore, like 3 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet. So uh, the main work of Action Track One is to really develop game-changing and systematic solutions to accelerate the reduction of hunger and inequality, make nutritious foods more available and affordable, and make food safer. So really the food, cheese, uh, the food choices people are faced with are the result of the food systems they are part of. So transforming food systems to provide healthy and affordable diets, um, food choices, while being mindful of the environmental livelihood and equitable and resilience implication of of their choices is really important. Yes, thank you. And I know that's gonna be wonderful. Um, I had a chance to look at that a little bit and I, I was drawn to the track one and the track four, the one on nutrition fall and four on equity. Uh, just one quick question, during that summit, will we have to just pick one track or will we be able to do more than one? Um, to my understanding, I think you can contribute to as many of the tracks depending on your time and capacity. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Adi Mohammed, and we appreciate everything you're doing for Zero Hunger. We're going to turn it over now to Diana Daniels.
Um, yeah, before we actually uh, do our next audience polling, I would just love to, to ask another question, um, put you on the spot a little bit off the, uh, just to hear a little more maybe about a specific project that you've worked on that has been most meaningful or inspiring to you. Um, I would just, yeah, love to get a bit of a better sense of that. So actually um, this past year, we um, conducted a series of introductory roundtable discussions with North American indigenous communities. And it was um, really exciting to see the organization formally reach out and engage them into the UN Food System Summit process. And it was really a learning process to understand the types of marginalizations, challenges that they're facing and, and what their practices offer and how you know, food systems are so diverse and engage different stakeholders and how in moving towards the food system summit, we really need to work collectively as a community and learn from different practices about uh, how to create a future. So it's really um, an exciting project that I was able to contribute to. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for answering that. Um, yeah, I think we can move to our next audience polling um, to get people involved little bit more, um, a little bit more engaged. So I will go ahead, the poll will pop up and I'll go ahead and read those questions aloud as well. Okay, so our first question for everyone is, um, how close to you is either your local farm or any local farm? Um, and bonus points, if you can name one of those farms in the chat as well, um, it would be really fun for everyone to, to see that. So you can go ahead and guess um, sort of the mileage of, of how close that farm might be to you. Um, and that will totally vary on what kind of area you live in. And our second question is, how often do you get your produce from farmer's markets? Um, so that could be every week, a few times a month, a few times a year, rarely, never. Um, so just to sort of get these questions or to sort of get a sense of, of people's um, engagement with their local food communities. And um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and give you a couple minutes or so to fill that out. Um, I have a lot of different answers here, obviously. So um, for some majority of people who answered, they do have a farm within 10 miles, which is really amazing. That's very, very close um, to homes. And for others, 20 miles, 50 miles, um, not sure. And how often do the, our attendees get produce from farmer's markets? Um, majority would say a few times per year and with others varying responses, um, whether it's never or weekly. So, um, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that just sort of gives, gives everyone a sense of sort of the varying degrees at which um, we're either aware of, of local produce that is grown near us. Um, and so either if we're aware of that or how much, how often we, we buy from them or um, receive produce from them. Um, all right, so I think we can go ahead and head into our next panel discussion. Um, I am so pleased to introduce our next two speakers that are with us today. Um, so we have Vanessa Garcia Polanco, who works for the Young Farmers Coalition and is an experienced leader, scholar, speaker, writer, and organizer working with food, agriculture, and sustainability stakeholders to create and strengthen sustainable and just food systems and communities with research policy and programmatic interventions. And we also have with us Roberto Mesa, who is a farmer on a mission to cultivate, heal, and transform communities with access to fresh food. He co-founded Emerald Gardens, a year-round greenhouse farm in 2017, and this past year in 2020 co-founded the East Denver Food Hub which works to create an equitable, sustainable, and resilient food system that meets the needs of communities and rural food producers. So thank you to so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited to speak with you. 
And to begin our conversation, um, I just sort of wanted to ask a general question of what the impact of the pandemic has been on your work and what new solutions, innovations, challenges have arisen from this period of time. Um, feel free either of you to respond first. Yeah, definitely. I can give you a really um, macro level perspective and a bit uh, we were to can fill in the gaps. So when we saw the beginning of the pandemic, uh, us as a coalition, National Young Farmers actually conducted a rapid survey and engagement. And we did a lot of pivoting, like usually we, as an organization, we do a lot of grassroots organizing and we try to uh, pivot to providing more technical assistance and support uh, to our farmers. We rapidly put together uh, resources for our farmers and for community members who wanted to support uh, more uh, local agriculture and uh, local and regional food systems. And we actually saw what we what we saw and we reported from our farmers was that many of them were able to make that pivot. Like many of our farmers were most of them already do direct market sales, like farmers markets, our community supported agriculture. But many of them had to get really creative if they had never done it before. We heard from farmers who literally had to like pave their entryway to their farms that had never done before because instead of going to the farmers market, farmers markets were canceled and people had to come to the farm to pick up stuff. Uh, myself, I had to get far, uh, farm produce delivered to my door that I never had before, which before I could just pick it up, you know, farmers markets were not open. And as a coalition, we tried to put forward resources that we knew our farmers needed. We created this amazing guide that we just heard that was the most downloaded resource in our website about how farmers market could create an e-commerce site. Because um, for many people who had, didn't know where their nearest farm was or near farmers market was, and they were going to the stores for the main first time in their lives, they were not finding things that they needed to eat that were culturally appropriate, things that they're used to eat. It was a lot of canned goods if we were lucky to find them. So I have a lot of people calling me, where can I find cheese? Where can I find kale? Where can I find things that I always knew the answer or where to find? So we definitely saw a relocation of resources and attention towards our local and regional food systems. And we saw many great farmers able to make that transition by putting their sales online, by create, becoming more social media savvy if they were not before, and focusing on feeding their communities in a really rapid way, fast way, and a community-oriented way. And that's what we saw uh, across the country. And we saw that young farmers are highly adaptable and able to uh, cope with these really uh, stressful situations to make sure that food gets out of the, out of the farm to where people need it. Good to see you, Vanessa, everybody here. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add, you know, my story was um, impacted by the closure of a very important uh, grocery chain that we were supplying before COVID hit. And because we wanted to honor the relationships, we didn't really follow up on past due invoices, but it was around eleven dollars to $12,000 that we were already kind of hurting at the beginning of the year. So when COVID shut down our, our service industry, restaurants and our partners, um, that was kind of the double whammy that um, really kind of put us in a compromising situation. And like Vanessa mentioned, we really had to get creative and find different ways to pivot. Um, you know, as farmers, we're naturally resilient because we're working with so many variables and uncertainties, the climate and market shifts and trends. Um, so we, you know, we really relied on our problem solving skills, on our observation to pinpoint um, and identify opportunities and possibilities. And you know, we saw that COVID um, in the beginning, it was quite a scramble, but it revealed to us both the challenges and new paths forward. So what we ended up doing was uh, basically pulling in our resources and working with a, another local food co-op so we enacted a kind of collective model to aggregate our products um, and meet the needs, the food needs of our communities. And that really allowed us to understand essentially the, the missing links that were there all along. So we activated those connections by relying on cooperative and collaborative values that ensured not only our viability, buffering the economic challenges of that period, but also a lot of other local farmers as well which for us was an amazing look at how the values that we actually need to buffer the pandemic and environmental economic situations and transformations are really the, the values that we need to institute from the very beginning. 
So we actually started working with food access organizations, food pantries and food banks who were receiving a lot of funding from the federal government, local and state organizations to meet the food insecurity that the pandemic was causing. Now that they had this funding, uh, we relied on the relationships that we had built with them previously as our commitment to food justice that really allowed us to understand this incredible model of local procurement. Um, that essentially created a, an opportunity for us to understand the benefits of community wealth building, economic justice, and food autonomy that now because of disruption in the supply chain, we really had to rely on one another in our communities to define the, the, the food ecosystem that allowed us to buffer some of these hardships. And now we're really leading with that effort as we move into this year to amplify our partnerships, to promote this model of food autonomy so that we can all really you know, partake in co-creating a local and regionalized food ecosystem that both meets the needs of communities that are experiencing food insecurity while addressing the viability of small, medium-sized, local, and farmers of color. Thank you both. Um, yeah, it's really, really inspiring and wonderful to hear about everything that you're doing and, and the just uh, amazing way in which you're able to, to turn around the circumstances and sort of create these really special um, structures and systems. Um, so while we're focusing today on SDG 2, Zero Hunger, uh, we know that the sustainable development goals are very interconnected, especially to poverty, health, decent work, uh, and economic growth. So I'm wondering how we can bring an intersectional lens to food systems and what are some areas where you see the connections in your work as well? Definitely. Uh, I can tell you my favorite SDG is actually SDG number 10 reduce inequalities because I feel like if we reduce inequalities we can address zero hunger uh, an example one of the things that I love about the work that we do at National Young Farmers is that we prioritize racial equity and food justice we always trying to talk about those inequalities and how do we uh, solving those inequalities in food and agricultural systems help us address other issues like hunger and poverty in our communities. So for example, some of the things that we definitely like to champion is uh, we should be reducing inequality on who gets to farm and who gets to buy a farm. Because if we, we know we have more young farmers and farmers of color uh, farming, uh, they will be closer to our communities. They will be food closer to our communities. Those food chains will be stronger and more resilient. And especially for, I speak for young farmers when I say this, most of our young farmers are not doing this because of business. They're doing this because they wanna feed their communities. They wanna focus on community building uh, and well being, and focus on all the opportunities that we should be tackling at the community level there. So if we wanna, reduce zero hunger, we can start by reducing inequalities on who gets to buy land and who gets to access resources at the federal and national level to be farmers and to produce food for our communities. Yeah, that's an, a really excellent question because it does point to a necessary paradigm shift that we all need to really integrate and implement in our daily work and within our organizations. Uh, to really understand you know, how to end hunger we need that intersectional lens to understand all the factors that are undermining communities' efforts towards self-determination. Um, that's why we really try and promote a comprehensive ecosystems perspective on how um, we, we begin to address the root causes of hunger. Access to resources, low wages, access to social services all need to be taken into account. In my work with um, the emergency food providers and donation-based food systems, you know, it's really a one-sided look of where that food is going to, but not so much who grows that food, how equitable um, that labor force is being treated, um, you know, basic um, protections for immigrant farm workers. How do we ensure equity and dignity, not just where that food is going to, but from the seed, the aggregation, production, and distribution of that food? And we need to ensure that all the way through the supply chain. So having that awareness really allows us to understand what are the partners necessary to bring in so that we can collectively address those gaps in our understanding and in some of the problems so that we can come up with innovative solutions. 
but you know, we understand how the system works. If we begin to really trace each of those strands back to where you know, it's originating within the structure that we operate within, now we have a little bit more creativity and some agency in moving kind of moving past some of these challenges to really promote um, the self-determination of communities. It really is a matter of giving people the necessary tools and resources that they need um, to make the appropriate decisions of how to heal their communities and how to improve their livelihoods. Yeah, thank you both. It obviously touched on a lot of different, um, you know, a lot of different resources that need to be to be given for for people to be um, supported and successful in this area. And Vanessa, you also touched on a bit on, on land and who can buy land as well. And I think that's an extremely important part of this, obviously in, in the land back movement for indigenous communities as well, but also ensuring um, that people of color can get access to land too. So I'm wondering if, you know, if that's something that's just like a policy, like if can that be solved through policy or like what, what are your thoughts on that as someone who works in that sphere? Yeah, definitely. So we actually issue a land policy report in 2020 that gives you a lot of recommendations at the local, at the state and the national level on how we can make sure land is more accessible uh, to young farmers. Um, and one of the things that there are also, also some policy solutions out there like instituting a national land trust that will actually help transition a lot of the farmland. We know a lot of the farmers want to retire in the next five to 10 years. So how is the way we don't instituate a national land trust that will help transfer the land to young farmers? Uh, another land proposal there is the Justice for Black Farmers Act that will help give land grants to black farmers. As you probably heard in the United States, uh, black farmers are extremely in decline. We have lost millions of black farmers in the last, um, in the last century. Um, so we're definitely trying to think of, of strategies that will also focus in land, uh, land back and land rematriation for our communities of color, especially also indigenous communities. Uh, but it's also when we think about land, it's thing, we have to think about all the other intersectional issues of why getting land is so hard. And for young farmers, one of those reasons is having student loans, which if we, you are from the United States, this may sound really foreign to you, but it's a really American thing. Uh, the higher education is really expensive in this country. And many of our young farmers went to school to become farmers or not. And now they have massive debt. And if you want to buy a farm and you have 30, 50,000 in a student loan debt, it's really hard for a bank or FSA to approve uh, a loan for you to buy a farm. So again, when we're thinking about barriers for farmers and land access, uh, it's actually things that may be related to agriculture, related to like economic justice and access and who gets to be a farmer in this country. Yeah, and I'd like to kind of um, elaborate on that of what we're doing locally. Um, uh, Emerald Gardens has 35 acres um, out in Bennett, Colorado. It's basically at the entrance to the Eastern Plains. And, um, you know, we, we haven't been able to really optimize the use of that land because our production has been mostly focused on controlled environment greenhouses, as well as um, shipping containers that we've modified into controlled environment mushroom operations as well. And we've really wanted to promote land access as our commitment to you know, being a, a more equitable agent in diversifying um, the agricultural community here. So what we've been really interested in exploring is the resonance between Emerald Gardens as a year round farm with the resource of land counterparted with the East Denver Food Hub, which is an organization that is connecting the dots in the local and regional food system and creating private and public partnerships for capital acquisition and resources as well. So together, these two kind of poles or you know, uh, nodes of synergy have been very important in how we've been able to promote land access and acquire capital from our partners. Um, as we begin to create a kind of cooperative community wealth building model for the organization and our partners on the farm, we're learning how, um, you know, a lot of our philanthropic partners and people with the resources that can help young and beginning farmers and BIPOC farmers start their operations, how they begin to think. And so for us, it's, it's important to leverage the 
the synergy between both of these two organizations that offers a model of, de of democratizing risk and financial risk that um, you know, the, the people with capital now feel confident that there's more partnership in one project to ensure its, its success. In Colorado, there's amazing initiatives happening linking local farms to food access initiatives, such as the Colorado Food Pantry Assistance Grant, as well as a Denver specific Healthy Food for Denver's Kids initiative. And in a kind of greater um, capacity, the Good Food Purchasing Program, all are geared to really be levers in promoting local procurement and in assuring that resources flow back to the communities that grow the food that are that's on our table. So we, we're really hoping to leverage all of these partnerships and provide a pipeline or kind of path toward um, land access and jumpstarting new farming operations in this ecosystem perspective between all of our partners and all of our organizations. Um, you know, I think we really need to think about how do we install a we all win mentality? How do we think in terms of, um, you know, a social food web? We know the harmony as farmers that exist below in the soil food web. Now we need to kind of adapt that biomimicry approach to our social spaces and our food ways because nature has already figured out that model. I think we just need to figure out how to implement it in our social relationships as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both so much that, you know, our next question sort of directly ties into that is, you know, do you think that cultivating these small community centric um, food systems will help eradicate hunger, which I think is clear that we we do believe that. But I'm just wondering if, if either of you have any more thoughts on sort of how we can get there. Um, you know, Roberto, we've heard from you about how you've been able to build this, this beautiful, strong community um, in East Denver. And I'm just yeah curious if you have any thoughts on how we can how we can do that everywhere else as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I think for us, we really like to kind of combine um, again our, our biomimicry approach to solving social problems, and at the same time, rapid prototyping um, you know pilots that will allow us to activate those those models of, of liberation, economic justice and food sovereignty. Um, so for us, it's really a matter of like, just trying things, seeing what impact it has, seeing how the community feeds back, hey, this is working, this is not working and really kind of laying our ears to the ground to, to listen and to be sensitive to um, new ways of, of, of modifying and shifting gears. Um, you know, I think that really, kind of zones in on the grass, literally grassroots approach, because um, a lot of times, you know, we don't have time to sit around a table and discuss everything that needs to be perfect in order for a project to be launched. Um, it's one of the reasons why we chose to organize our organizations as social enterprises that, you know, really our boards are the people that do the work. Um, we really support what um, people bring to the table what a community member has an idea that they want to see in their community, we try and make that happen. That's literally how we launched the mushroom farm. Um, and so leveraging the assets that we have, I think is uh, the first step. Sometimes we start with our deficits, but there's so much that the community already has. Um, and we just need to come in to support that in a way that allows the community to decide um, what needs to be done with those resources, that technical assistance, um, or, you know, creating their own partnerships. But a lot of times, you know, we really tend to make those decisions, uh, I think, as nonprofit organizations or organizations with a lot of wealth and power, um, rather than kind of alleviating and checking that so that people from the individual community can make those determinations for themselves. But, you know, we see expressions of uh, an equitable food model in every corner, in every relationship. And what we're figuring out now is, you know, how do we get collective buy-in on a larger scale to amplify and to elevate that model so that it does become a model that everybody partakes in, including our institutions. But first we need to understand, you know, what are the paradigms that we're operating within? 
that are challenging even some of these simple pilots. Um, but I think for us, it matter is it, it just is a matter of, of trying things, of doing it and having the confidence that the community can facilitate um, the challenges that we encounter in some of these barriers as well. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add like, obviously what Roberto is doing is amazing on the ground, but we also should be trying to get federal funding and resources to make sure uh, we can funnel those resources organizations like Roberto. Uh, and that's what, my, that's what my job is, is to make sure I advocate that the US Department of Agriculture and other agencies are supporting enterprises like Roberto's who are feeding our communities, strengthening our food chains and creating the communities we want to see with zero hunger. Thank you both. Um, I now would love to move into our audience Q&A section just because I know I've seen a couple questions pop into that, pop into there and I wanna bring all of our speakers together uh, to give them a chance to respond to those. Um, so the first question that we can start with that we've gotten from the audience is, is reducing hunger primarily a problem of growing food or distributing it? I think, um, can I answer? Or, yeah, um, anyone feel free to answer. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know, oftentimes we hear you know there's enough food to feed everybody in the world but um or but you know is this food accessible and is it nutritious and the answer is simply no and um i think food access is a key um, indicator here there's lots of food deserts where people just cannot physically access food and then also um you know as i mentioned earlier people cannot afford healthy diets um, and so really um, having community-led initiatives that can fill this gap is really important. Um, I think we definitely need a two-pronged approach. People need food now, and that's something that no one's going to negate, but we can't get stuck in just kind of the donation-based model um, in this emergency mode. We need to think critically and engineer a long-term plan so that we can measure our impact in the food access space, not by how many people rely on donations of food, but by how many of them rely less and less on food donation. That's when we know that we're actually addressing the root causes of hunger. So it isn't necessarily just a matter of um, production and distribution of food, but really understanding you know, access to capital, resources, low wages, um, things that I think really point, pinpoint to an economic um, model that is more oriented towards community wealth building rather than extractive models that create surplus and then kind of go back to the community in the form of donations. And one of the, the, the things that we're really hoping to do here and are making a lot of strides in is in creating a, an amazing relationship between our food pantries and our food banks that are investing their procurement dollars back into the community rather than you know, uh, relying on outside sources or again, a model that is more extractive. So learning how to understand the circularity of resources, of wealth, of food is how we begin to create this self-generating momentum that promotes our communities in a better situation. Any more panelists want to respond to that? I like to add, I uh, at recently attended a, a conference on universities fighting world hunger. And uh, there were a lot of presentations on establishing uh, food banks, especially like even on campuses and how to make those more efficient and how to do it uh, with pride where people can still feel good about their situation uh, as we recognize that esteem can sometimes get damaged through, uh, through that time. Did any of you have any connection to that uh, conference? Because there were like over 90 percenters. So I, I can't tell who, if, if any of you were there by chance, but. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, we previously used to partner with universities fighting world hunger, but unfortunately the two we weren't, but glad to hear that you found it very interesting and hopefully yeah. you can join in the future. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, the second question is, what can we do on the local level to support initiatives to meet the goal of zero hung uh, hunger? And uh, this uh, question comes from someone who's interested in what nonprofit organizations can do and what individuals can do too. So if you wanna break that down. I'm happy to give you a suggestion. Obviously there are many different strategies to address hunger in or at the community level, but also as community members and as individuals, especially in nonprofits, we should get more comfortable telling all elected officials uh, that hunger is unacceptable in our communities. Uh, unfortunately, we see a lot of silos and a lot of community groups not engaging in policy and advocacy is that, yes, we should be feeding the people who are hungry in our communities, but if you're not telling your elected officials that it's hunger in your community and the hunger is unacceptable to you, uh, as a community member, and this one you don't want, a, you don't want a future with hunger in your community. Uh, we are perpetuating, we're perpetuating the system. So one of the things you can do, and obviously there are many ways you can engage in this, is uh, reaching out to your elected officials at different levels, so they know that this is happening, that they know that we need further in community investment and nutrition investment and other kinds of investment to address hunger at the root. Uh, obviously, a lot of those interventions are needed and good, but we need to start thinking about systematic and structural solutions. And obviously, uh, a great example is what is happening in the US right now. For the past year, we instituted this family food bots program to address uh, hunger during the pandemic. And we had a massive meeting with 600 people gave testimony. And most of the people said that the program was not working. It was a great idea, but and after hearing from so that many people, many advocates across the country, USDA just yesterday decided to cancel the program and instead is gonna relocate all the resources and money to other um, hunger uh, fighting solutions who have proven more effective. So we need, to, we need to be advocates and we need to raise our voice about the solutions that are working and communicating those to our elected officials so we can uh, start building those, communi those communities with zero hunger. Wonderful. Any more comments? I guess I'd just like to add that, you know, it really is a matter of building solidarity with our consumers. Um, they have a lot of agency in terms of transforming the local food economy to abide by a different set of values that promotes equity and inclusion and justice. And so, you know, when we think about the price of local food, oftentimes we think it's inaccessible when in reality, you know, it's the dignified price so that farmers can make a living wage, they can pay their workers a dignified wage, they can cover their costs. But, off, but I think you know, we've been conditioned to think about food purely as a monetary um, transaction rather than a, an investment in our community and in people. And so if we're able to shift our um, procurement choices and our purchasing power um, to abide by those values and awareness that, hey, my dollar is going to promote the, the security that a farmer needs to make sure that they remain viable and that they're able to pay their workers digni in a dignified wage, then it becomes a community investment project. Um, and that's something that I would love to see more and more of um, where consumers understand you know, the value of food and the value of labor so that they can make those appropriate decisions and begin shifting the values of the greater local and regional food systems. Excellent, excellent. And the last question is, do we have to reimagine a different food system in order to eradicate hunger or is it possible to change our food insecurity abundance within the current food system under capitalism? Not sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the, the second part of the question, but I do think uh, you know, a food systems transformation is very much needed just because we're seeing, um, you know, hunger is still rising, obesity is still rising, and then just the sheer impact our current food practices are having on the environment and biodiversity loss. So there needs to be a lot of incentives to promote 
climate smart agriculture to really shift the um, understanding of the pricing of food and how, you know, how, how we pay and how we respect the people along the, the, the workers in the agricultural food supply chain. And then also bringing a lot of innovations and, um, and knowledge to, uh, to farmers to empower them to be change makers. So I think just looking at it really from a multi-dimensional perspective and elevating farmers ability to be decision makers and to have access to resources are, are gonna be really critical to, to transform it. And also um, just dedicating more land to nutritious foods will be really important going forward um, so that we're able to have policies that can actually promote these types of uh, products instead of um, you know, um, less healthier alternatives. I would just like to add, and I'm trying to form a connection here, um, but I think it's important before we act, before we, we, we execute a plan to really reckon with the history of capitalism, to understand the agricultural roots that are um, intersecting the evolution of capitalism within the United States, for example, uh, so that we begin to understand what historical legacies are still at play. One thing that I think we can do, for example, in kind of trying to connect this, and I'm working through this point as I'm speaking, so bear with me, um, is, you know, I think the USDA can definitely become a, a player in this in shifting a lot of these issues. One possibility that I would like to see is revisiting, um, you know, USDA parameters for child nutrition programs. Um, that they become more health equity oriented and that become more equitable in terms of who's able to supply those programs. Um, how can we leverage these nutrition incentive programs and reimbursement of meal um, initiatives that are in within our reach right now to, to ground them in these newer values and to democratize access to them for small, medium scale producers and aggregators and distributors. So, you know, they can really be a player in, in this discussion and in shifting the um, dominance of hunger within the space. Thank you. Um, just something that kind of combined both of those last questions. Um, in some recent conferences I've gone to dealing with poverty, uh, I would make the point, and it was also made at this um, recent conference I mentioned, a lot of us rely, a lot of people tend to rely on uh, the nonprofits when re in reality, most of the, uh, the money going to help programs come from the federal government. And, and, and as she said, we have to advocate uh, and we have to uh, speak up because it's one thing to go and have our fundraisers locally. And those are wonderful. Yes, we want to do those. But let's speak up for those federal programs such as SNAP, especially when they're being threatened to, to, to get sliced and to get cut. You know, we, there's petitions that we constantly are sending out and, and we need to sign those. We need to write our legislators. We need to meet with them uh, at our capitals and, and nationally, you know, whatever it takes. And a lot of times we will have some movements to do that so you can participate in that. Did anyone else have any more comments? Just one more comment uh, for me is that, you know, uh, I think it's great that we actually have a deadline to end hunger. Similarly to emergency food providers, you know, I will, I'm always wondering, do you have an expiration date? Is your food pantry here to meet the immediate need or to be in here for the long haul? And what does that actually mean? How are we thinking about hunger in, that, in those terms? Are we actually eradicating it? or are we merely managing it and far worse perpetuating it? So trying to really ask those questions is important. At the same time, as we disentangle corporate interests in the anti-hunger um, industrial complex to really hold them accountable to the eradication of hunger and what that actually means on the ground. Thank you so much. Um, we are just about at time. So um, we hope you are inspired to take action from today's session. Uh, you can start by taking action now to urge your members of Congress to support the UN's work to combat food insecurity around the world. You can text zero hunger to 30644 and you'll be taken to the advocacy form to, co to complete to have your voice heard by members of Congress. 
thank you, Diana. And please join us for our upcoming GEOS programs. To get updates on future GEOS programming, text GEOS GEOS to 30644 also. All of our past recordings can be found on the UNA USA YouTube channel, and you can now watch the Global Engagement Summit on demand throughout the website. So don't miss the amazing conversation on zero hunger uh, with the World Food Program and a zero waste cooking demo with Chef Arthur Potts. Join UNA USA as a member to continue these conversations and engage further with the UNA USA community. And remember that for 20, for uh, people 12 years old to 25, that's free. So let's take advantage of that and work together to change zero hunger. And remember, if a great future is desired for us, it must be inspired by us. And thank you for all you do. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so oh, much. And thanks all of our, our helpers behind the scenes. <laughs> Emily and Jillian and Anna Mahalik and Marco, everybody. <laughs>